there. Um, I thought I'd try to teach through Romans 11. A couple days has passed. Uh, and, you know, we've marked and avoided the people we need to mark and avoid. And uh, But the belief systems... Um, I wouldn't even call them belief systems, really. The, the, the error needs to be addressed, you know, because it's spreading like wildfire. And you just want to have, you know, a view from the scriptures of how do we refute this idea that the church is Israel and why is it important, you know? Uh, and Romans 11 is one of the most, chapter, you know, Romans 9 through 11, Paul deals with Israel, past, present, future. And what is their role going to be? Because now that there's the church, is there going to be a kingdom? You know, a literal kingdom with the Christ ruling from the throne of David in Jerusalem? Are the promises of God of no effect? What is our faith? You know, our faith is in the testimony of the prophets concerning Christ and his, uh, his death and his resurrection. If God lied about everything else, though... <laughs> How can we believe the testimony of the prophets concerning the son? You know, if they lied about everything related to Israel. No, they, God is not a liar. Um, and, you know, it's just good to review chapter 11, especially where Paul makes the point very clearly that Israel still has a role in the future. And God has made covenants with Israel. In fact, Paul tells us uh, that the covenants um, are from are for the Jews. Um, Romans nine, he says, uh, the Israelites to whom pertains the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of law, the service of God, and the promises. Who are whose are the fathers? And whom is concerning the flesh, Christ has come, who is over all, and God blessed forever. Now, they have this role in the past related to God's testimony concerning the one who would come, Christ. And they're the ones to whom, with whom God made covenants. Uh, and remember, Jesus was a Jew, you know. But... Uh, now, one thing is, if you believe that the church is Israel, and Paul is saying that we are Israel, then why would he be talking about them? Why wouldn't he be saying, you know, to us pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises? He doesn't. He's talking about Israel, right? And in chapter 9, he's talking about his anguish for his brother and that he knows who are not believing the gospel but in chapter 11 he tells us that that Israel to whom belong the covenants the, the glory the promises Christ has a future and has been cut off as a branch and yet will be grafted back in because this is the covenant God has made with them when he takes away their sins. And he says in Romans 11, 25, that there's a mystery that partial blindness has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentile comes in and then all Israel will be saved or it is written out of Zion shall the deliverer come. For this is the covenant I made with them when I take away their sins. And that covenant, by the way, is the new covenant. Um, now there's two verses that people use to try to say that the church is Israel uh, or Jews. The first one is in Romans 2 where he says that the true Jew is the one whose circumcision is not in the flesh but in the spirit and in the heart and not the letter. Uh, now he was talking to people who were trying to who who were boasting in their Judaism and in their circumcision and in their adherence to the law and saying look you're just by trying to establish your own righteousness you're just rejecting the righteousness of Christ and storing up wrath for yourself in the day of judgment you're judging the gentiles who we talked about in Romans 1 for being delivered over to all kinds of various lusts and everything but you're no better <laughs> 
you are lawbreakers. You're even worse because you're close to the things of God and not ignorant, and you think that you're a teacher. You think you're wise because you know the law, and you think you're an instructor of babes, but you're not the real circumcision if your boast is in the flesh, because the true circumcision is in the heart and in the letter, or in the spirit, not in the letter. Now, what he's talking, and, and your glory is from God and not from men. He's speaking to Jews who are boasting in circumcision, which is ironic because circumcision is on a private member and is a subject of, actually, it's a shameful thing. And what we've talked about a lot is that circumcision represents the cutting off of the religious efforts of the flesh. We saw that in Galatians. Abraham produced Ishmael trying to help God fulfill his promise that only God could fulfill by the efforts of his flesh. He went into Hagar, committed adultery, produced Ishmael, tried to raise him as the heir. And 13 years later, when God visited him again and said, no, in Sarah, the seed's coming forth and I'm going to visit her in the time of life. It's got to be supernatural. It's got to be me. He gave him the circumcision as a sign that this salvation comes from God, not from me. And it was on his productive member, meaning the efforts of the flesh do not avail in the things of God. And Paul uses Ishmael and Hagar as a picture of the law and the flesh. The children of the flesh who are trying to be justified by the law, uh, who are committing adultery with the law, and are trying to establish their own righteousness and are showing that they are uncircumcised. As long as, you know, Ishmael represents the uncircumcision of Abraham, but then Isaac really comes out of circumcision, which means God cut off, and Abraham agreed with him, I got to cut off my efforts in trying to do this thing. Righteousness is by faith. And cry, you know, the seed has to come from Sarah and then he counted not the deadness of his own body and the barrenness of Sarah's womb, but gave glory to God who gives life to the dead and calls those things that are not as though they are, counting that he is faithful and he's able to perform his promises and he's going to have to do it supernaturally. The Christian life is supernatural. Serving God is supernatural. It, it got, it's God from start to finish. That's what the reality of circumcision is. Uh, points to. Circumcision is a picture, but the reality is the circumcision of the flesh, which Christ accomplished on the cross. According to Colossians 2, it says that uh, he, we were buried with him in baptism into his death, and uh, he circumcised the flesh. He cut it off there. And to be the cir true circumcision is to not boast in the flesh but boast in the spirit, trust in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Uh, he says in Philippians 3, we are the true circumcision who glory in God, we serve by the spirit, and have no confidence in the flesh. So we don't put stock in the flesh. Uh, that's what the true circumcision is about. And Paul was saying in Romans 2 that you Jews are boasting in the flesh, showing that you're not circumcised. You're boasting in your flesh circumcision, but that's not the reality of circumcision. You have not reckoned yourself dead. You have not judged yourself. You know, not, justification has always been the same. Nobody could ever approach God by law. Those who finally reckon, were reconciled to God through faith at any time have had to deal with the flesh. David did. Abraham did. Jacob especially, which brings me to the next point. The other place that the Bible talks about the uh, uses a verse that people try to hijack to say that we are Israel is in Galatians 6 where he says uh, what matters is cir not circumcision or uncircumcision but a new creature or a new creation and peace to everyone who walks according to that rule and mercy and upon the Israel of God and we showed we saw in uh, Galatians that Paul is using Israel as the third member of the three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And remember, Jesus revealed God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, meaning he's the God of the living. And we talked about how 
our life, our Christian life is a pattern after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They represent different aspects of the Christian life, uh, are the life of faith. The first is Abraham having to learn to believe in God's promise when he had nothing to show in himself and he couldn't depend on himself anymore. That's circumcision. Then Isaac represents the sons of the promise who come forth from God's power, not from the flesh. And then uh, there's Jacob, who Paul calls Israel, because in Jacob, we saw him wrestling with God. He spent his entire life trying to swindle the blessing that God had already decreed for him, and he couldn't give it a rest. He could not stop the efforts of the flesh. And finally, he wrestled with God, and he was so strong that he prevailed, and so God finally had to touch his thigh uh, to permanently weaken Jacob. And even then, Jacob wouldn't let go of God, and he said, I will not let go of you until you bless me. And so God renamed him to Israel. And Israel signifies the moment when Jacob was transformed to become a man of God having to lean on a staff rather than support himself. He could no longer depend on the efforts of his flesh and he had to lean on God. And that was the beginning where he became a real blessing and he was able to bless the sons of Israel, prophesy accurately, bless Pharaoh. Right? Um, so we talked about all that. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob slash Israel is the pattern of Galatians 3-6 through 6, and it's how Paul talks about walking according to the spirit versus walking according to the flesh what it really means it means you give up dependence on trying to satisfy your conscience with law keeping and instead rely on the blood of jesus christ and the promise of god to be right with god and also for the supply of the spirit and eventual fruit of the spirit which comes by walking according to the spirit not according to the flesh the flesh really represents the strength of man so He's not saying in, it's the same thing in Romans 2 and in Galatians 6, when Paul uses the true Jew and the Israel of God in both cases, he's talking about the reality of what circumcision represents, which is, I have no confidence in the flesh. And that's a principle that's always existed. Everybody had to learn it. I mean, we see it in Abel and Cain. Cain had confidence in the works of the flesh. Abel had confidence in the testimony of God concerning Christ. Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac. Abraham had confidence in his ability to make the thing happen, and he produced Ishmael. That was the flesh. But then he re he learned from God that he was going to have to wait on God, and Isaac would come from Sarah, even though her womb is barren and his body is dead. Well, that represents waiting on the God and believing his testimony concerning the seed. And we see that through the scripture. You either believe God or you're confident in the flesh. And even under the law, they weren't justified by law keeping. The law was there to show them that they were wicked and that their, their flesh was ruined and their mouths needed to be shut. That the Jews especially should have been more humble than the Gentiles because they had the knowledge of the law. Because that law condemns them, but instead they puffed themselves up and said, well, we're teachers of the foolish, we're guide to the blind. We can show you what righteousness is because we are righteous because we know the law. That's confidence in the flesh, which actually is a repudiation of the reality of circumcision. So again, when you hear people saying, we're the Israel of God or we're the true Jews, that's the context. The real, we are not the true, Paul is not saying the church is Israel, nor is he saying we are the true Jews. What he's saying is we're the circumcision. And that's a spiritual principle all the way through the scripture, whether you're a member of the body of Christ or if you're a member of Israel. Now, in Romans 9 through 11, Paul clearly shows us that Israel and the Gentiles are two separate branches. Uh, the uh, Israel is the natural branch. This is the seed of Abraham according to the flesh that believed. And they're the natural branch uh, at home in the olive tree. Well, actually, not not only the ones that believed, but also the ones that were not believing were part of that branch. And for 
to be a branch in this context in Romans 11, it's talking about usefulness in God's purpose for the spreading of the testimony of Christ. And when Israel was cut off as a branch, uh, God turned to the Gentiles, right? And for the last 2,000 years, it has been the time of, it has been the time of the Gentiles, and the Gentiles have been the instrument that God's used to give the testimony of Christ. Because Israel's been cut off. We were grafted in contrary to our nature. So we're a second branch, but we're not grafted into Israel. We're grafted into the olive tree, which is the, which has the root and the fatness, which is God himself as the spirit, the glory, and Christ. Um, but he says that the Gentile branch may be cut off, and Israel will be grafted back in. And when they are grafted back in, it'll be glorious. So let's just read through chapter 11, and you can clearly see that he's talking about two different groups. He is not saying, we are Israel. We are the branch. We are that branch. No, he's saying we're a different branch. Okay. Uh, so he says, he, he first asks the question, I say then, has God cast away his people? Who? Us? No, the Israelites. God forbid. For I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people who he foreknew. Where, don't you know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he makes intercession against uh, to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets and dig down their altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what says the answer of God to him? I have yet reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now he's talking about a, a believing remnant. Okay. On the one hand, Israel is a branch. But on the other hand, in Israel, not everybody who says they're an Israelite is a true Israelite, but there's a remnant. And the remnant are those who believe the testimony of the prophets concerning God's son, the seed. The remnant, like during Babylon, when... Babylon uh, just took over Israel and the temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. Everybody who did not believe the word of the prophets stayed in Jerusalem and perished. But those who did believe the word of the prophets knew to go to Babylon. God had told them, if you go to Babylon for 70 years, I'll bless you there. You'll multiply and I'll bring you back. He said that through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you know, or I'm sorry, just Jeremiah and Isaiah. I guess they're Jeremiah. Uh, and we see, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah and Daniel and all the, everybody who prospered and was faithful in Babylon, even though there was no temple and no law that they could keep, they were justified by faith. They were the believing remnant. The believing remnant is those who were justified by faith. And there's only one way to be justified before God. It's always been by faith. But the others, Paul said already in Romans 10, I believe, that they were uh, ignorant of the righteousness of God and sought to seek their, sought to establish their own righteousness through the law and stumbled at the stumbling block. They rejected they rejected God's testimony because they were righteous in their own eyes. They were not the true circumcision. The true circumcision of those who believe the testimony of the prophets concerning Christ. Um, and that is the remnant. Okay. He says, even so then, at the present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Now the remnant during the time that Israel was a branch were Israelites. But today, the remnant of believing Jews who are preserved by grace uh, and foreknown are members of the body of Christ. Because today, if you believe, you become a member of the body of Christ, in which there is no Jew or Greek, but Christ is all in all. Okay, so remnant is speaking specifically to the the seed of Abraham, the physical seed of Abraham, who believe at any time. They're called the remnant, and they, they are elect. They're called the elect. The elect is not... Gentile believers, it's Jewish believers. That's a term specifically for Israelites. Okay? But today, if you're one of these elect, like I have Jewish blood, I was adopted, but I therefore am, I guess, one of these remnant. 
well, I'm a member of the body of Christ, so I'm not even Jew or Greek anymore, right? But uh, I would be called part of this remnant. But Paul considered himself part of the remnant, right? Um, so then he says, uh, they were. It was a, according to the election of great grace. There is a remnant. So he's answering the question. No, God has not cast off his people. Even today, there's a remnant. There was a remnant in Elijah's time. There was a remnant during the time of the Babylonian captivity. There's always been a remnant, and today there's a remnant. Today, though, they're members of the body of Christ. Uh, in the tribulation, the remnant will be the 144,000 of the tribes of Israel, actual Jews. And they will not be identified as members of the body of Christ, but they'll be identified as Israel. Um, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, it is grace is no more grace. But if it's works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more work. He's establishing that this is about grace, not works or righteousness. What then? Israel, not the church, has not obtained that which she seeks for, but the election has obtained it. And the rest were blinded. So the election talks about the remnant. Everyone who believed was one of the elect, just like everyone who believes today is predestinated on the sonship if they're a member of the body of Christ or chosen in him. Well, they were the elect, okay? And election obtained their standing before God for them in grace. And the rest were all blinded. Everybody in Israel who didn't believe was blinded, okay? And guess what? Every Gentile who doesn't believe, who associates themselves with the things of God, is blinded. If you don't believe the testimony of Christ, even though you call yourself a Christian, you're blinded. If you don't believe the testimony of Christ, even though you're a Jew, you're blinded. The rest are blinded. According as it is written, God has given them a spirit of slumber, eyes that they might not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. Now, he's talking about them. They. There's a group of people that are blinded. Okay? And he's talking about Israel. He's not talking about us. We're not blinded. And uh, David said, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and their stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow back their own way. Okay, so we know that it's bad. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, come, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now here again, two groups. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them, who? Israel, to jealousy. And it's Israel, the branch. Israel, the nation. God is not done with that nation. He's wanting to provoke them to jealousy. And he's doing it through the glory that's now in the church. The glory that used to be in the Israel as the branch has departed that branch. And now it resides primarily among the Gentiles, although there's some Jews that believe and are part of this glorious indwelt temple, the body of Christ. Just as during the time of Israel, while the glory was in the temple and only among Israel, there were Gentiles who had joined themselves through faith to the Jewish people and circumcised themselves so that they could be associated with that glory. Wherever the presence of God is, that's the active branch. <laughs> now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, the fall of who? Israel. And the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Who? The, Gent the Israel's fullness. Not the church's fullness, but Israel's fullness. Um, and then he says, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation those that are my flesh and might save someone. He wants his brethren, according to the flesh, Jews, to be saved and become members of the body of Christ in this time. But then he says, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Now, when Israel is grafted back in and God turns his attention back to Israel, that will also be coinciding with the resurrection, the first resurrection, when the dead in Christ have been raised up and raptured, right? And seated in the heavenlies in Christ, uh, appearing before him in glory. And also, I believe the Old Testament saints, uh, at some point, will be 
resurrected in in their land. Maybe at the end of the tribulation, but definitely, yeah, most likely when he reconciles them, they're going to be raised. the The dead are going to be raised who believed this remnant. That's called the first resurrection. the The dead in Christ are raised first, and then those who believed in Christ, uh, who were part of Israel, will actually be raised into the land. We're going to be raised into the heavens. They're going to be raised into the land. That was the expectation they set, and that's exactly what the prophet said will happen. Ezekiel 36 talks about it very clearly. In that day you will not know that I was the Lord uh, when I open up the graves. He's going to open up the graves in Israel. And remember, Jesus said, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will sit down in the kingdom and, and feast. They're going to sit down with the Israelites who are saved from judgment uh, and saved from the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, and reconciled to Christ. Um, but yes, the what, reconciling of them, the casting away of them was the reconciling of the world and riches for the Gentiles. What shall the receiving of them be but the life from the dead? The resurrection is, has, is all tied in to the establishment of the kingdom and the throne of David, the literal coming of Jesus Christ. For, for his people, Israel, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now here's where he's talking about branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, doesn't say grafted into Israel, we were grafted into the olive tree among them. And with them partake of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, Boast not against the branches, but if you boast, you bear not the root, but the root thee. Boasting is a type of pride. Okay, and he's going to tell you exactly what that boast is. Thou wilt say then, the branches were cut off, or broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Now it's ironic, he's saying, look, they were, bro they were broken off. Don't boast against the branches. You're saying they were cut off so you may be grafted in, right? But realize that they were cut off because of unbelief. And these who are boasting against, against the branches, you know what their problem is? Unbelief. They do not believe the promises of God are literal concerning the kingdom. They've allegorized the promises to Israel and, and put them on the church and say, we are the true Jews now. We are Israel. We get their covenants, we get their promises, and we get their kingdom. That's a that's not true. Okay. Now you may believe the testimony of Christ, you may believe and be justified, but you shouldn't be high-minded and you need to repent of this because it's a kind of unbelief. And they were cut off because of unbelief. So why would we want to be an unbelief if we're believers? We want to believe the word of God. Not reason it away and allegorize it and spiritualize it and say, no, he doesn't literally mean it. That's just poetic language. No, it's literal. Um, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also not spare thee. Now, he's not really talking about individuals here. What he's saying is that the Gentile branch, see, the Gentiles, just as the Jews was a mix of believers and unbelievers, but they're called Israel. Today, the church is a mix of believers and unbelievers. The true body of Christ... The, the, the true believers were called the remnant in Israel and the elect. In today, the true believers are called the body of Christ. They're actually members of Christ. They've been regenerated. They have his life. But there are many in Christendom, Christianity, who go to church and associate themselves with Jesus Christ, but don't believe the gospel and don't believe the testimony of the prophets. Just like there were people who perished in Jerusalem who didn't believe the gospel, didn't believe the testimony concerning the seed, and didn't believe the prophets. It's the same thing. And they were cut off and blinded. Well, the Gentile branch is also going to be cut off and blinded. We know that Paul and all the apostles prophesied that in the end, people will be heap up after themselves, teachers after their own lust, going after seducing spirits and doctrines and demons, and reject all the fundamentals of the faith. And there will be a time when the gospel cannot make any headway among the Gentiles anymore, and it will be time to cut off that branch. Just as God cut off the branch of Israel when the gospel couldn't make any headway anymore. And that happened in Acts 28 really clearly. Paul 
quoted that scripture from Isaiah again and said, well, has God spoken of you Jews that God, you know, he's given you a spirit of slumber, hearts that can't, uh, heart, hearts that are fat, eyes that can't see, ears that can't hear, you're, and, and I'm turning to the Gentiles. The gospel's going to the Gentiles now. That was the cutting off of that branch. Well, God's going to cut off the Gentile branch and re-graft in Israel. And it's because of unbelief. Just as they were cut off unbelief, the Gentiles are going to be cut off because of unbelief. So it's really dangerous. Replacement theology is a step to unbelief. It is a clear denial of the clear testimony of the prophets concerning God's people, Israel. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity toward the goodness if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you'll be cut off. And they also, if they abide not in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in. And the first group to start that during that time when he grafts them in, the Israelites that believe will be that 144,000. And they're not going to be justified apart from faith. They'll believe the gospel. But then they'll be sealed. And they'll be a new kind of thing. Oops, I just passed my uh, exit. Okay. Uh, where was I? For I would not, here it is, for I would not, brethren. Now this, when he talks about a mystery, he means something that was previously hidden that has now been revealed by God to him. This is revealed by Jesus Christ himself. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits. There's that conceit and boasting. Boasting against the branches, thinking, well, I'm a Jew now. We're the true Jews. This, you know. Uh, he says, lest you be wise in your own conceit, right? That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And for this is my covenant unto them when I take away their sins. That covenant is the new covenant. And when, you know, Jesus condemns sin in the flesh. In, on the cross. He put an end to sin. But sin is still in our flesh. How is he going to deal with sin in our flesh, ultimately? Well, he's going to transfigure us. He's going to transfigure the body of our humiliation unto the likeness of the body of his glory. We're going to put on immortality. Then sin will be swallowed up. But what about the Jews who enter the land during the kingdom? According to Daniel 9 the end of the prophecy concerning the Daniel's 70th week, the, the scope is 70, 70 weeks are determined on your people and upon the holy city Jerusalem and one of the things he says is to put an end to sin or make an end of transgression and to bring in everlasting righteousness. The new covenant actually does that. We get our everlasting sinlessness through resurrection. They get it on this side as mortals by the new covenant. But this is my covenant when, under them when I will take away their sins. And he means take it, take it away from them. Literally, deliver them from sin. I will give them a new heart. Take away the heart of stone. Put a new heart in them. Uh, take away the heart of, and give them a heart of flesh. And put my, a new spirit in them. And put my spirit in them. And I will cause them to walk in my ways. And they will not depart from them. They will not break my statutes and ordinances. They, I will write my law in their heart and in their mind, and they will keep it. So he doesn't say they'll partially keep it, somewhat keep it, incrementally keep it, learn to keep it, try to keep it. They will keep it, and they will be a holy people. And I still need to dig out all those scriptures, but there are tons of scriptures that show very clearly and literally that the Israelites will be a holy people, and the Gentiles will be amazed at their living during the kingdom. They're going to live in the land for a thousand years as mortals. And their life is going to be a thousand years long. And they're going to live it in a very glorious state. Okay? And this is the new covenant. Remember, he said in Romans 9 that the, theirs are the covenants. Um, and as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloveds for the Father's sake, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Gifts 
callings of God, that's not talking about your music gift or your your ability to read fast or whatever. No, it is these promises that God made to the fathers. See, for the fathers' sakes, uh, they are beloved. See, God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob concerning their seed. Not just, yes, it's Christ to whom all the promises are made, but also their literal seed. And uh, God told Abraham, you know, your seed will be multiplied as the stars of the heaven and as the sands of the seashore. The sands of the seashore are earthly, the stars of the heaven are heavenly. Um, and I believe Christ is multiplied in the church as the heavenly company and also in Israel as the earthly company because he's reconciling all things in heaven and in earth. This is what God's building. And he has a kingdom that has an earthly component with a throne that's literally in Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, that that's why we believe Jesus is coming back. Otherwise, there's no second coming. You know, the Catholic Church allegorized the promises concerning the kingdom and said, well, the kingdom's in our heart now. It's just spiritual. And that meant Christ was never literally coming. Or if he did, you couldn't really know what it meant. But the Bible's very specific exactly about how he's coming back. And that's how we know we live in the time. Because Israel has been regathered into their land that you know that nation god promised through the prophets that they would not lose their identity you could read this in ezekiel 36 and 37 i believe uh they wouldn't lose their identity even though they were being punished and scattered among the gentiles the gentiles would say these are the people that left their land these are the people of god that have left their land and for the last 2000 years Jews have been very distinctly identifiable as the people of God who, who were put out of the land because of their disobedience and unbelief. They've been preserved. Their identity has been supernaturally preserved. There's never been another nation that left the land and yet kept their culture and beliefs in intact. They're partially blinded. And there's a remnant among them that believes in every generation. And for now, they're becoming members of the body of Christ. But during that time uh, during Jacob's trouble and then after the believing Jews will become members of Israel when God grafts that branch back in right now the branch has been cut off and it's till the fullness of the Gentiles come in and now the Gentiles have been grafted in but the Gentiles through unbelief will be cut off and Israel will be grafted in there will come a point when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and then all Israel will be saved because God made a promise to them. And this is my covenant with them. I want to take away their sins. That's a covenant. Cut with blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. Um, and who died for the nation. And for the sins of the whole world. But also specifically for the nation Israel. Uh, that God may be just in passing over their previous sins. Um, and he can be just in reconciling that nation to himself. So, uh, yeah, and, and the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Now, when you read this chapter again, and can you honestly say that you can read that and see say that Paul is talking about us when he's talking about Israel? He's clearly talking about a different group of people. He's talking about somebody else. He, call, he calls them them. And he made it very clear that he's talking about those who are Israelites according to the flesh. But he, he tells us, look, it's, we know that not all Israel is Israel, but there's a believing remnant. You know, that's always been true. There's always been a remnant. Okay. Even today, there's a remnant. And, and we who get saved, he said, I'm one of them. These Jews are a believing remnant who get saved and become members of the body of Christ. That's while the, the Gentile branch is grafted in during the time of the Gentiles. But Israel will be grafted back in, and when when that happens, it'll be life from the dead. That's the first resurrection. Why? Because Jesus is coming to establish his authority, and he's going to open up their graves. The first event that happens is the resurrection of the church, which is the rapture, and then God turns to Israel to graft them back in. And when he raptures the church, guess what? The Gentile branch will be cut off because all that will be remaining 
will be those who associated themselves with the things of God and went to church and called themselves Christians but didn't believe the testimony. They're going to be left behind as a cut-off branch. All right, I hope this helps uh, bring clarity to some of these things. And uh, I'm at my destination. I will talk to you soon.